screen. Hello, everybody, and welcome. And thank you for um, being on for a couple minutes while we were just fixing a few little glitches. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this amazing webinar, Managing Ticks at Home and in the School Environment. This webinar is being put on by the Tourette Association of America, and my name is Wendy Wegman. I am the Education Specialist here at the Tourette Association. We're funded by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, to bring programs like this to the Tourette community. Our presenters today will have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Feel free to put questions in the question panel throughout the webinar, the Q&A panel. If there are questions that we run out of time to answer, we'll do our best to respond to our registrants with answers in an email. I'd like to introduce our presenters, Brandon Morgan and Dr. Jan Rao. Brandon is a therapist and a licensed clinical social worker at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He is a CBIT certified and he is CBIT certified and specializes in the behavioral treatment of tick disorders through outpatient ther therapy and an interdisciplinary tick clinic. Brandon also provides behavioral interventions for insomnia, anxiety, depression, ADHD, and obsessive compulsive behaviors, and values opportunities to provide education and support for families and community providers. He has a Master of Social Work from The Ohio State University and a Bachelor of Science in Finance from Miami University. Dr. Jan Rao is a formal, former faculty member at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Department of Occupational Therapy, and that started the Pediatric Tourette Syndrome and Tick Cl Clinic Disorder at the University of Alabama in January of 2010. Since her retirement from UAB in 2012, the clinic has moved to the Children's Hospital System of Alabama. Dr. Rao is the first occupational therapist to coordinate a CBIT clinic and has begun training other occupational therapists to work with children who have Tourette syndrome or tick disorders. She and Dr. Dure from Children's Hospital are working on a Tourette Association grant with Cornell to manualize CBIT for occupational therapists. Throughout her clinic, occupation, or, I'm sorry, throughout her clinic, occupational therapists have been found to be effective at um, at treating CBIT, and they offer another route to therapy for families. Jan received her doctorate from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. In 2004, her master's in public health from the University of Alabama and did her undergraduate work in 1990 in occupational therapy at the University of Central Arkansas. And on that note, we are ready to begin. Go ahead, Brandon. Okay, thank you so much, Wendy, and welcome everyone. We are very happy to have you. Um, we're gonna kick things off by talking about managing ticks at home. Um, and then uh, Jan is gonna uh, continue with managing ticks at school, but let's go ahead and move uh, move through managing ticks at home. I have a lot of material to cover. Um, I think we're gonna be um, providing some of this information after the fact. So I've tried to type the information on the slides in a way that um, you could kind of revisit and really understand the whole thoughts that are being delivered. Um, so there's quite a bit of information there um, and you'll find me moving a little bit quickly, but I'll, I'll try to make things as digestible as possible. Um, so let's go ahead and get going here. We're going to cover a few things in managing ticks at home. We're going to start with just a, a very quick overview of what are ticks exactly. I know if you're here, you probably already know a lot about ticks, but we'll just do a very brief overview of that. We'll talk about what, from a very high level, tends to improve and, and also make ticks worse. We'll talk about specific tools on managing ticks at home and then uh, also tools in managing stress at home because as, as you probably know, managing stress also improves uh, ticks. We'll finally cover a few resources that, that can be helpful for families. So what are ticks? Ticks are movements or vocalizations that are sudden, rapid, repetitive, 
non-rhythmic, they don't have a purpose, and they often mimic fragments of normal behavior. We'll talk about a few examples of, of, of tics in a couple of slides. Um, tic disorders are neurodevelopmental. That just means they involve the nervous system. Um, they typically become evident in early childhood, but sometimes in adolescence. Their tics are generally preceded by something called a premonitory urge. A premonitory urge is some sort of physical sensation. It's often described as a tightness, pressure, tingling feeling, um, sometimes an itch. Um, and once the tick is performed, that feeling goes away and it reinforces the tick and, and it becomes a habit that way. Tick diagnoses include a transient or provisional tick disorder. If your child has received one of these diagnoses, just means that they've had ticks for less than a year. Um, chronic persistent motor or vocal tick disorder. This is having motor ticks. So those are ticks of the body or vocal ticks for a year or more. And then if they've had both motor and vocal ticks for a year or more, that's when they would receive a, a Tourette uh, syndrome diagnosis. So there's a lot of misconceptions on what, uh, what uh, constitutes a Tourette diagnosis. It's literally just having motor and vocal tics for a year or more. It's as simple as that and onset before the age of 18. So let's talk a little bit about um, the prevalence and the typical course of tics. So chronic tic disorders, that's tics lasting for a year or more, um, occur in about 1% of the population of children. Um, Tourette's is about three to six in a thousand kids. It's probably underdiagnosed because a lot of times ticks just go unnoticed. Um, but up to 25% of kids have ticks at some point in childhood. It's a very, very common phenomenon. Four to one, it's more common in male children than female. And typical onset is between the ages of four and eight, although we see them as young as um, you know one or two years old. Um, and again, it, they can also first show up in adolescence or teen years as well. Um, there's often, there, there's a, gene, a genetic predisposition also. Um, I think it's about 12 to 15% of kids with Tourette's have a parent with Tourette's as well. Ticks are usually worst between the ages of about nine and 13. This is an average, so it's not, it's not always the case, but that's just usually what we see. They tend to wax and wane over time. That just means they improve and worsen um, depending on what's going on. Um, they will change in form. So uh, one tick might disappear and another one pops up. They are often worse in times of stress or change. Usually ticks start in the face or the head with smaller movements, and then they move down the body and um, evolve into larger movements. So what are some examples? So some examples of motor tics would be blinking, eye rolling, nose movements, facial grimacing, um, shoulder shrugging, head turns um, or jerks, uh, hand movements, arm leg movements, even abdominal tensing uh, or back arching. These are common ones. And complex tics can include sequences of simple tics, squatting, jumping, touching things, shivering, um, Copropraxia, which is obscene gestures. It's not all that common, but we do see it. And vocal tics would include throat clearing, sniffing, grunting, barking, clicking, humming. And complex tics would be stringing words together. It's the same string of words every time. Whistling, singing, repeating other words, uh, others' words, repeating our own words, um, and coprolalia, which is obscene words. Again, that's not all that common, but we do see it. So how do you differentiate? Um, we're not gonna talk deeply about this, but quickly, um, how do you differentiate tics from something else? So uh, oftentimes obsessive compulsive behaviors, I saw an early question about this, um, and tics can be, uh, can, can be mixed up. The big difference there is an obsessive compulsive behavior starts with a thought. And if the obsessive compulsive behavior is suppressed and not performed, the anxiety, anxiety tends to increase. The difference between that and a tick is if you hold a tick in, which is difficult but can be done, um, 
that premonitory urge or physical sensation that precedes the tick, that becomes worse. So it's really the different difference between thought content and a physical sensation. And when an obsessive compulsive behavior is suppressed, anxiety increases versus that physical sensation or discomfort. Um, ADHD and ticks often um, mixed up. Uh, hyperactivity can, can often be mistaken for ticks. And then stereotypic movements. The only difference between ticks and stereotypic movements are the presence of that physical sensation. Usually stereotypic movements don't have that. And also st uh, stereotypic movements have a rhythm. So hand flapping is a common stereotypic movement. Um, rocking is a common stereotypic movement. And then I think it's important just to, to provide a note on functional movement disorder. You may or may not have heard of this, but um, functional movement disorder, sometimes referred to as conversion disorder. Um, you might see the word psychogenic used um, with this or functional neurological disorder. These movements can look exactly like ticks, but there's a few differences. They come from a different part of the brain and usually functional movement disorder um, starts in the teenage years and they reach peak severity very quickly. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the obscene gestures and obscene um, um, words that are popping up pretty abruptly in the teenage years. You might consider that those could be functional movements. But just uh, just to let you know, everything we talk about today in terms of managing ticks at home and in the classroom will apply to both ticks and functional movement disorder. So if your child has functional movement disorder, please just, just know that what we talk about today will be helpful. Um, treatment varies slightly. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is recommended for functional movement disorder, whereas CBIT, comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks, is recommended for ticks. Common co-occurring conditions, um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, um, somewhat common is obsessive compulsive disorder, um, but obsessive compulsive disorder is usually uh, accompanied with significant functional interference and engaging in those behaviors for an hour or more per day. But a lot of us or most of us, if not all of us, at some point have obs uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors. And so that's very common, especially with kids with tics. Um, anxiety disorders, um, ADHD and sleep concerns are all very common among kids with tics. Um, ADHD is actually upwards of 50% co-occurring with kids who have Tourette's. So let's talk about some things that impact tics. So from a very high level, uh, things that worsen tics attention. So thinking about, talking about, paying any attention, commenting on tics. Uh, our body's stress response or emotional responses can increase tics. General tiredness affects stress levels, so that worsens tics. Boredom and other environmental factors, which can just vary from child to child. Uh, what improves tics from a high level? Ignoring and minimizing all attention to tics. Um, unless you're actively working with a therapist on tick targeting strategies, um, ignoring is the best policy. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Relaxation to bring the heart rate down and therefore decrease stress. Focusing the mind, so getting in the flow in an activity, as long as that activity is not overstimulating, um, uh, getting that mind really focused can, can help improve ticks good sleep schedule and duration, and also um, having a good routine. So what are some examples? So ticks often increase during times of stress and change. So examples of life and routine changes that can cause more ticks. You might notice that ticks get much worse a couple weeks before school starts, and then a couple weeks after school starts, just as kids start uh, try to get acclimated to their new routine and they're experiencing a lot of change, new teachers, maybe new peers. Um, so that's a common time for ticks to be worse. Uh, vacations, we see a lot of uh, kids going on vacations and having a lot of new ticks or uh, worsening ticks just because they're out of routine in a new environment. Changes in peers, switching schools, 
um, or going from being in one classroom all day to then switching classes. You might see a lot more ticks. Um, any changes going on with family members, moving, um, losing, or having a sick loved one or pet. Um, situations where ticks can be worse, while watching television or video games, especially if they're highly stimulating TV or video games, arriving home after school, during homework, in stressful classes, in public places, especially kids. Kids are more conscious and they're trying to hold, uh, they're more conscious of their ticks, which actually makes ticks worse. Um, physical activities, sports, in the car, anticipation or waiting, um, meal times when there's a lot of people around, um, bedtime routines, and sometimes even the presence of a specific person, we might see ticks increase. Um, some attention and avoidance factors that may, can make ticks worse. So it's common attention-based factors where you'll see ticks get worse. If a child is told to stop ticking, so we recommend not doing that. Um, if the child receives comfort when ticking, this is a tough one for parents oftentimes because we obviously wanna be very compassionate toward our children, um, especially when they're having a hard time, but believe it or not, comforting a child um, and bringing attention to the tick itself because of the tick can make the ticks worse. So comforting and, and continuing to ignore the tick is recommended. And then if the child's looked at when ticking or um, laughed at or asked about ticks, that can make ticks worse as well. It's also important to, omit, to mention escape-based factors. If a child is asked to leave an area because they're ticking, that can make ticks worse. Um, or if the child is allowed to escape um, a chore, homework, or a situation because they're having ticks, um, we'll talk about how to maybe offer breaks without allowing the child to escape that activity. Because what you'll see is, like homework, for example, if a child is allowed to skip homework because they're having especially bad ticks that day, ticks are going to show up at homework time the next day. So, especially in non preferred activities, if they're allowed to escape that activity, the ticks will be reinforced for next time. So let's jump into managing ticks at home. We've already talked a bit about this, but let's get more specific. Um, when should you worry about ticks? And this is also when um, treatment might be indicated. And for the most part, if ticks aren't bothering a kid, I encourage you not to worry about it. We base treatment on, on whether a child is bothered or not. So. Um, how do you define bothered? There's really three main areas. One, if the ticks are painful or they're causing any sort of physical impairment, that's a good time to be concerned. Two, are the ticks causing significant social problems? And three, if the ticks are, ticks are causing your child psychological distress, they're really stressed out about them, these are all times when it would be appropriate to seek um, treatment. Uh, and or implement some of the strategies that we're discussing today. It's really important to make sure that when considering uh, your objectives uh, in improving your child's ticks, the focus is on quality of life. This is not necessarily always related to a reduction in ticks. Um, sometimes it could just be merely helping your child accept their ticks and you know, this message of, hey, don't worry about them. They're really common is an okay one, um, unless your child's in pain or, or something else is going on that's interfering with their ability to function. Um, acceptance is a great option. Um, so identifying the strategies and treatment course that improves quality of life is, is the best route. Um, if the ticks don't bother the child again, there's really no need for concern. Acceptance is the best path. If there's other co-occurring conditions and you're not sure what to treat first, I'd recommend treating the condition that's causing the most distress. If ticks are causing the most distress, by all means, start with ticks. If obsessive compulsive behaviors or anxiety or um, ADHD related challenges or you know, outbursts at home are more problematic, that's where I would start. And then ticks can kind of be dealt with. Ticks will decrease when you deal with those co-occurring conditions. And then if the ticks are still bothersome, once you've, once you've addressed the other uh, concerns, then you can address the ticks. But oftentimes you'll see if the stress from these other conditions decreases, 
ticks will improve substantially as well. So what can you do to help? Number one, reduce attention to ticks. You'll hear this several times in this presentation. Um, there's a reason for that, it's so important. Ignoring ticks helps. Um, engage with your child normally. You'll just selectively choose to ignore the ticks and then engage with your child um, in whatever you're doing. Secondly, you can adjust the environment. We call these functional interventions. Um, and we'll talk about what a few of those functional interventions are. Uh, third, relaxation and stress management. And fourth, seek additional support um, from a therapist, somebody who's trained in, in working with ticks. Um, finally, acceptance is crucial. Again, remember ticks are very difficult to suppress. They're very hard to even notice sometimes and control. They will become worse if your child worries about them. Um, so a few notes on ignoring. So advising siblings, teachers, peers, and coaches, it's totally appropriate to just let them know to avoid telling the child to stop ticking, avoid comforting the child, um, really don't laugh. Sometimes, you know, ticks can be, can, can sometimes be a little bit comical. Um, you know, for people that don't really understand the nature of them. And so it's really important to provide some education to those folks and let them know what's helpful. And that's just don't react to them. A quick note on ticks virals. If your child's worrying about ticks, it could cause the ticks to get worse. When, when the ticks get worse, they tend to worry more, which causes more ticks, which causes more worry. And so the way out of that is encouraging your child not to worry about them and to accept them. So let's talk about a few of these environmental adjustments that you could make at home that could improve ticks. Um, these are important to implement if your child's bothered by ticks. If, if a parent is bothered, it's important for the parent to seek support, practice acceptance, and also implement some of these changes because you can implement a lot of these environmental adjustments without even mentioning or bringing attention to the ticks. So a few examples, homework time. If your child has ticks while doing homework, having a relaxing activity before they start their homework could be really helpful. And then having short breaks scheduled while they do their homework for a minute or two even um, can, can really help decrease ticks. Ticks after school, I recommend just having 15 minutes of free time after school before you make any type of requests. Um, and then also having a really good routine. You'll find that adding routine, adding schedules around um, after school and at bedtime especially can be really helpful. Um, you'll see a lot more ticks usually during TV and video games, especially highly stimulating ones. So you don't need to necessarily shut down highly stimulating um, online activities. Just no ticks will be worse when, when the more stimulating an act, uh, a screen time activity is. And if your child's bothered, you might encourage them towards calmer screen time options or shows that they've seen many times before and they already know what's going to happen. Um, and then having screen time limitations is always helpful. During meals, eliminating um, tick exacerbating stimuli about 15 minutes before mealtime and just letting your child settle down a little bit, removing any stressful stimuli that or during the meal. So if they're watching television while eating or there's a lot of stress at the table, just everybody kind of calming down can really help decrease ticks. At bedtime, again, having a good routine or having, and having a wind down about 15 minutes before they get in bed. And then in the car, having fidgets or calming activities available. Um, the escape avoidance, addressing those with environmental adjustments, Making sure you don't ask your child to leave the room for ticks is helpful. Um, and then uh, making sure that they don't, again, escape from homework, but can take short breaks during homework, but not able to miss out on homework because of ticks. Avoiding sending your child away from the table um, and making sure that they stay in their room even if they're having ticks at bedtime. So, just a few quick notes on managing stress at home. Kids with tics often have more uh, of a challenge with emotional regulation. And so teaching kids self-regulation and promoting it at home can, is especially important. 
Uh, so what does that mean? Um, it's really just helping kids learn how to manage emotionals, emo emotions appropriately for situations. And this can involve noticing triggers that result in these outsized emotions. Um, it helps to accept and discuss dis difficult emotions openly with kids and also to explore prevention strategies in situations that tend to bring up a lot of emotions. Um, the Tread Association has a wonderful booklet on emotional overload. This is it here. Um, and uh, you can find it on their website. So just some brief tips on managing behaviors. Uh, reg having regular one-on-one -on -one time with your child where you don't make any requests, you're simply just spending quality time with them in, a act in an activity that they choose. Even four times a week for 15 minutes can make a big difference. Um, planned ignoring of unwanted behaviors. So your best bet when you get behaviors that you don't want is to ignore it and just keep ignoring it until it goes away. And then as soon as you get the behavior that you're looking for, praise it. Even if you've had behavior that you didn't want for the prior 30 minutes, if you praise the behavior you've had for a minute that you do want, it's going to make a huge difference. So whatever we give attention to, we get more of those behaviors. Um, establishing and maintaining routines, having daily check-ins and talking about feelings, having simple rewards. It doesn't have to be huge rewards, just something very simple for adherence. Working on self-regulation as a parent, is great modeling for a child, having relaxation strategies that work and that your child um, will engage with. And then if you're still having emotional outbursts, working with a behavior management specialist can be really helpful. A few examples of relaxation, um, diaphragmatic breathing or simply teaching your child to just slow their breathing down. One thing I mentioned to parents a lot is um, make sure that breathing is enjoyable for your child. A lot of folks were tempted to kind of say, just take a few deep breaths in times of stress, and then children tend to uh, have a negative association with breathing. So I really encourage breathing to be a positive experience. Um, having a relaxation area in their room or somewhere at home where they can relax is great. Exercise, of course, calming music, meditation, having calming screen time options, there's some great relaxation apps out there. Um, progressive muscle relaxation is something that could be helpful to jot down. There's lots of guided um, uh, opportunities on YouTube and scripts available online that you can use to guide you. Um, and then again, identifying and encouraging your child's preferred relaxation practices is a great way to get going. Um, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm just gonna kind of breeze through these last slides, but just a quick note on co-regulation. It's important to, to know that families regulate together. Whatever you're, uh, whatever you're doing to kind of take good care of yourself in the household, it will have an effect on your child and vice versa. So having good self-regulation practices as parents is a great way to model for our kids what that looks like. Um, what does co-regulation involve? Communication, so especially communication about feelings, um, compassion, understanding our children as we are doing the best we can. Um, having good structure, routine, and scheduling can really help with this. And then again, having good self-regulation practices. Where can we seek additional support? So CBIT, Behavioral Treatment for Ticks, if the ticks are really bothersome to your child, Typically, it's recommended for eight and older, but younger kids can be good candidates as well. And again, where ticks are the primary concern as opposed to co-occurring conditions. Um, the Tourette Association has a nice pamphlet on CBIT that's also available on the website. You can learn a little bit more about what in, is encompassed in CBIT. And then just from a referral standpoint, if ticks are bothersome, there's a great find a provider tool on the Tourette Association website where you can find a CBIT trained therapist. A general therapy referral is appropriate if ticks are not the, the, what's most bothersome for your child. Um, if there's diagnostic uncertainty, I'd recommend a uh, checking in with your, your primary care provider um, and maybe requesting a referral to neurology if there's still uncertainty. 
And then if you have concerns about the presence of ADHD, learning or cognitive concerns, um, a psychological evaluation, or if it's more complex, a more complex presentation, a neuropsychological evaluation um, could be really helpful. Finally, um, we're all familiar with the Tourette Association, just what a wonderful organization they are. Um, as you know, at Tourette.org, there's just wonderful resources available. So I encourage you, if you haven't um, been there lately, check it out. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jan. Thank you so much. One minute, everybody. I'm so I think lucky. I'm back. You are here, Jan. I'm so sorry. I'm going to, I'm supposed to share your screen and it is not coming up as an option, even though they're open on my laptop. So um, excuse me for one minute while I try to figure out why. I can do it from here. It's okay. Okay. I may need are to, you... I have them here. Let me just try one thing, one quick. Oh, okay, thing. sure. And um, let's see if this will work. For some reason, they're just not showing as an option on my share screen. Oh, no, it did work. What I did work. Go. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. There you are, Jen. Oh, it's the wrong. Okay, we're not seeing. So sorry, we're seeing um, Brandon. Do you have them available, Jen? I'm Actually, sorry. I'm not seeing anything. You're not seeing yes. anything? Yes. Okay. I just stopped sharing. Are you able to share? Okay, I'm going to. I'm very sorry. I have them open. Your screen, and once it comes up, you just make Jen speak of you. Oh, wait, let's see. Maybe I can get it. Are you able to see it? I just shared mine, Jan, so. Okay, here we go. Yep, I found it. So here we go. Sorry, everybody, for that confusion. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I thought it was all ready to go. All right. That's okay, we can flip through. Go ahead and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're not seeing the, um, no. okay. How about, um, let me try mine again. And then if that doesn't work, then um, maybe we can just post it for everyone. I can just see from, like just have it going. Uh, I don't know if that will work or not, but are you able to see my screen? No. Oh boy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, you know, I, Jen, I think I can do it. I think for some reason in your presentation, I had those blank slides came up. Sorry, everybody. Thank uh -huh. you for your patience. And I don't know why they were there, but um, um let's see if I find it. Just bear with me. Um oh. I just shared it. Um, I also have them available, um, at least the version that you sent me, Jan. So it, if yes, as a last that's resort, correct. I'm happy to share mine as well um, and, and control the slides for you. Okay. Either one is fine by me. Do you have them there, Brandon? Yep. Do you want me to go ahead and do that? That would be fantastic. Thank you. Great. Okay. Just give me <laughs> one minute. Okay. Just let me know when you yeah. can see my screen. 
Got it. Okay. okay. And if you'll go ahead and advance for me. First one. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Brandon. So um, a lot of this will be um, just reinforcing what Brandon's already said, but we're going to be um, specifically looking at the prevalence of um, excuse me, um, influencing uh, the influences in environmental factors um, in the school or educational environment. Um, and then also identifying strategies to minimize those antecedents and consequences in that educational environment. Okay, next slide. So, and you can go ahead to the next one, Brandon. So we don't, just for time's sake, we don't have time to actually do this, but for the next um, few seconds while I'm talking, and you can go ahead, Brandon, um, on this next slide, all I want you to do to sort of get in touch with what a premonitory urge feels like and a tick is while I'm going through this iceberg, um, just open your eyes as wide as you can without blinking, okay? And just think about the, the feelings that you're getting behind your eyes and how you're trying not to blink. And of course, I've already blinked several times, but just keep trying to open your eyes as widely as you can and keep track of how many times you have to blink. And we'll talk about that feeling in just a second. So some of the things that can exacerbate tics, um, Brandon has already touched on a few of these, um, but we know that anxiety is um, one of the biggest triggers for tics. And it can be something very vague or global in respect to anxiety or something very specific like that math test in, you know, um, that now that school has started for most kids, um, certainly here in the South, um, or just the, the upcoming start of school for those kids that haven't yet started until after uh, Labor Day that, um, in just a, a few days. Transitions can also be a trigger for tics. Um, those things that um, we're not used to, maybe a substitute teacher to the cafeteria or anticipating events. So there may be anticipating that test that you may or may not be ready for, but there's also the anticipation of um, homecoming coming up or in the spring prom um, or the ACT test. Any of those both positive and negative stress situations can trigger tick bounce. Um, fatigue and sleepiness can also be a trigger for ticks. We know that over 50% of people with um, tick disorders do in fact have um, sleep issues. So it's difficult sometimes to either go to sleep or stay asleep. So it's sometimes it's not just a matter of how much your child um, is sleeping, how many hours they're getting, but also the kind of quality of sleep that they're getting. Too many demands at once. If everybody's kind of barking orders at them, the teacher and you know their classmate and maybe their best friend, um, they're in PE and they have um, a main PE teacher, but then you know the PE teacher or the coach also has a couple of extra helpers. If too many people are asking too many things of the child, it can create tics. Um, and then of course, other uh, coexisting conditions like Brandon mentioned with OCD, or if this child actually has um, an anxiety disorder. Okay, next slide. Now, while we're moving to the next slide, I want you to think about that feeling that you had behind your eyes. So most people will describe a tick as that feeling, that premonitory urge feeling that just builds and builds until they're able to do the tick. And then for a split second after the tick, they get a, a, a bit of relief. And that's that dopamine kind of rush from the brain that then reinforces, unfortunately, that tick cycle. So we get that premonitory urge and then we tick and then it feels better. And because it felt better, because of that dopamine surge, then the brain tries to replicate that. And that often is why we see those tick bouts happening. Um, and they do tend to happen in bouts like that. Now, this graphic is taken actually from that um, emotional overload um, handout or toolkit that Brandon held up. Um, and I think Wendy has posted to the, um, the resources for all of you. But if you think about where um, the, the stimulus is coming from, and then the fact that many of these kids do have, kids and adults, have um, lack of a filter because it's a disinhibition um, disorder, Tourette syndrome and tick disorders are, then what you get as a result is the, the thing at the bottom. So if there's a movement, um, your, your brain sends you a signal for a movement 
And then there's that lack of filter, or if you think about gatekeepers in the brain and the gatekeepers aren't really doing their job effectively, then what we get as a result is either ticks or possibly hyperactivity. With regard to sensations, we know that there's a strong sensory urge to all ticks, but in regard to just body sensations that a kid or an adult might be having, if they lack a filter to sort of, you know, just not have to pay attention to that sensation, then what they might have as a result is a sensory processing disorder. Again, with regard to thought, lack of a filter could be one um, or several of the coexisting conditions that are so common with from ADHD, ADHD, OCD, or anxiety. And then finally, with regard to emotions. So if you have a strong emotion and then there's a lack of a filter, what you might get then is that sort of zero to 60 kind of emotion um, that seems very out of place, very extreme um, in those explosive behaviors and may or may not seem to have any real or predictable um, triggers. Next slide. So we're going to be talking about um, for just a few minutes here, what, what can you do about this? Um, because that's what most of you want to know. Um, and um, I'm not sure if the audience is all parents or persons with tick disorders in Tourette. Maybe we have some educators on as well. Um, but as Brandon said many, many times, and it just can't be said enough, the biggest thing that people can do is minimize the attention of others to the students' ticks. So um, that's peers and classmates and teachers and substitutes and you know um, other teachers in the hallway. Um, anybody that has interaction with that child, you want them to just think ignoring and minimizing attention to the tick, both good and bad attention to the tick. Um, expectations for that particular child that has tick disorder or Tourette should not vary. It should be exactly the same expectation that you have of every other student. The, the one thing that might change is that this student might need some support. And the way that we talk about support typically is in the way of IEPs or 504 plans. I personally strongly encourage these. Um, I think of them as a safety net for these kids. Um, even if they don't need it in the elementary grade years, they are most likely going to need them as they um, reach middle school and then junior, junior high, high school. Um, the reason for that is because the majority of these kids do have coexisting conditions. When you think that 90% of all people with tick disorders have at least one co-occurring co condition, um, they're likely going to need some accommodations. Um, the other thing that oftentimes, um, unfortunately, can either get in the way of and or be very supportive in the school environment is everybody's attitude um, towards this child um, with tick disorders and Tourette. So if ticks and Tourette are well understood in that educational environment, then typically this child is gonna have a really good experience. But even if a teacher doesn't really, um, or a, a, an entire um, school of teachers, they don't really understand ticks. They, they may not have a, a strong history of, of students with tick disorders or Tourette. The fact that they're open and willing to learn and willing to um, you know, find out like what's the best way to approach these kids, what, what kinds of accommodations are typically uh, recommended and sort of that attitude and, and thought process of how can we help, that's usually a, a really good um, sort of winning scenario for everyone. Um, you want to have communication with and for everyone. Your child doesn't need to feel like they're on an island when they go to the school environment. They need to feel supported um, from the time they walk out of your home um, until they get back into the home. So that's everybody from the bus driver, the person that works in the cafeteria, um, and janitors, everybody that they encounter in that educational environment. And then also just making sure that everybody has resources. And um, I can't agree with Brandon uh, more when he talks about the Tourette Association and the wonderful resources that they have. Um, that so many of them are free of charge. You can download them or, or ask for the hard copies that they'll um, happily send you. Next slide. Okay. Um, Brandon talked about CBIT um, as, also as a CBIT provider. Um, I'm not pushing CBIT, um, although we know that it's very effective, but it's not for everyone. The thing that I want to mention here is that if your child and or adult um, 
has been through CBIT, then they have some strategies that they can manage their ticks with. Um, CBIT is not a cure. It's, it's a tool for your um, student to be able to manage their ticks as effectively as possible. Sometimes that just means that the vocal ticks aren't as loud. Um, or they maybe don't happen with a lot of repetition. So if they're able to use their competing response or, response or their strategies, then maybe they're able to stop the repetition of those tick bouts, um, but the ticks still happen. And as Brandon said, we, we want kids and adults who have ticks to feel accepted. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having ticks. Um, and I also want to sort of mention here that ticks are ticks. You know, there's not, there's, while consequences of ticks will change if, if your um, student has, um, you know, a shouting tick um, or coprolalia where they're, you know, making rude comments or they're, you know, using obscenities or if they have copropraxia, so maybe they're, you know, gesturing in an in a obscene way. Those are still ticks and they have no more control of those ticks than they do of blinking or nose scrunching or a head jerk or any other kind of tick. Um, but if they have CBIT strategies or if they have other kinds of strategies, like maybe they work out a lot, um, they use a lot of physical activity to help manage their tics and they, they um, engage in the progressive mu muscular relaxation and other kinds of relaxation techniques, whatever helps them, then we're all about that. Um, because um, we, as Brandon mentioned, we, we want the, the person with tic disorder and or Tourette diagnosis to feel like they still have good quality in their life. And that um, typically is not met if people are giving them a hard time about their tics or reminding them of their tics all the time. Um, and, you know, the last thing we want to do as providers is um, create some kind of antagon antagonistic relationship between you and your child with always having to remind them to use strategies. Um, so think of CBIT as a tool. It's not for everybody, but um, it certainly can be helpful. Part of CBIT is looking at the environment and how the environment can both positively and negatively impact the student and and or ticks. And so I think it's the next slide that we can actually start talking about um, what kinds of adjustments can to the environment, especially when we're talking about school. Okay, so I agree with Brandon. Um, breaks are oftentimes needed and helpful, but I'm also um, fairly staunch in saying that um, breaks are not to get out of work. So if a child has to leave the classroom and it's for any kind of extended time, like more than 10, 15 minutes max, then they need to take their work with them. Um, when they take a break, it's not to get out of doing the math test or it's not to, you know, to get out of doing that group project with their peers, um, but they might legitimately need the break to be able to go and practice some strategies or relaxation techniques, kind of get themselves centered, bring everything down a notch or two, and then re-enter the classroom because that's what, that's the main goal. We, we don't want them missing content. We don't want them missing um, the instruction that they're going to be getting. Sometimes if ticks are just, you know, you're having a bad tick day, then, you know, if COVID taught us nothing, um, we certainly all know how to zoom into situations and in, in environments now, or Google Meet um, is met, uh, is used a lot in, in education environments. So having your student, um, your child go to a different location in the school, not go home, but go to a different location in the school, zoom into the class turn their mic off, be able to turn their camera off if they need to so that, you know, they're comfortable, people aren't watching them tick, they're not hearing them tick, but they're not missing any content from that class. They stay at school, they get their work done, they keep up with the instruction. Um, because what we know about kids with tick disorders and threat, these are bright kids. They're oftentimes very driven, um, they're overachievers. They don't want to miss out on content and get fall behind. And then if they have those coexisting conditions of anxiety or ADD or um, OCD, then um, oftentimes those can then complement, compl excuse me, um, that oftentimes complicates things for them because then they're even more worried about the fact that they just missed, you know, a half day of, of lecture. Um, so now they're very behind in school and they've got a lot of work that they have to make up. 
Breaks can also be used for, you know, doing those CBIT techniques or mindfulness or relaxation. Um, and it can look anything like um, just getting up and taking a short break to the water fountain or to the bathroom, or maybe just walking up and down the hall um, it, right out in front of the classroom. Um, for those schools that are very um, inclusive and allow kids to stand at their desk or move to a different area of the classroom um, to do their work and not have to stay seated at their desk or table the entire day, those are great settings um, for students with tick disorders because they feel less stress. And if they feel tick bouts coming on, they know that they have the liberty to just get up and move about in the classroom. They don't have to leave. Um, I think most of us that are CBIT providers and most of us that work in this area, we try to get students to understand that we want them to stay in the class as long as possible using whatever strategy they can before they feel like, you know, okay, I, I've done everything I know to do. I really need to just leave the class now. But again, leaving class is not leaving school. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I think we've talked about this, um, but just again, throwing those ideas out there for different techniques, um, it's not CBIT, um, all of these are very helpful, um, sort of level and help the student feel um, a little more control over what's happening with their body. Next. Okay. And we'll just talk for a second about functional assessments. Next slide. Okay. So we're always interested in those antecedents and consequences, understanding what happens before the tick bout, and then also what happens after. And what happens after can be good or bad, um, but it's usually one or the other. So um, thinking about, um, you know, those triggers or the thing that happened just before the tick bout happened, sometimes it seems just totally random. And it may be because we know that ticks wax and wane. Um, but regardless if there was a trigger or not, there probably has been a consequence to the tick. Um, so if somebody, you know, turned around and looked at you or if somebody made a comment or if you um, somebody mocked your tick, um, obviously those are negative um, consequences that happen after a tick. Um, but even things like, um, you know, somebody offering verbal or physical support to you, you know, are you OK? Do you need anything? Um, it, even that can be enough of a consequence and um, secondary reinforcement that it only keeps the tick cycle going. So that's why we say that, you know, stopping the attention to the tick or rewarding behavior really is a strong goal um, for all of us that work um, with people who have ticks and Tourette. Um, escaping assignments and deadlines and um, even self-care activities is not encouraged, um, almost never. Um, and what we are really working for is just rewarding efforts to minimize the interruption to activities and then be able to engage in activity. That is what we really encourage. And whether that's by using CBIT techniques or nothing at all, you're just ticking, um, but you're totally fine with your ticks. They don't bother you, they don't hurt. Um, you know, that student has great self-confidence. They're an advocate for themselves. I mean, there's nothing wrong with ticking. So if the, um, the student is, is feeling very empowered um, and able to do some education on their own about what ticks are um, and, and how the person needs to be um, sort of addressed when they do have ticks, then take it from that person because, you know, people who have ticks can tell you the best in terms of what their needs are and what, um, what's helpful for them to minimize a tick bout. Okay. All right, I said this already, um, but I do strongly encourage IEPs or 504 plans. And if you need help with that, the um, either your CBIT provider, if you have one, um, or the Tourette Association is a great resource. Um, they will um, actually have people um, like Wendy, who will um, actually help you and walk you through this process and also be available to you at the time of those meetings in school. Next. Okay, 
So specific approaches can be anything from what you see on the left part of your screen. Um, but I think the, the main thing here on this slide is that communication is just so key. Um, sometimes it's weekly feedback um, from teacher and family back and forth, um, but you definitely want consistent feedback, uh, both with parents and also um, teachers and anyone else in that educational environment. Um, I threw in a couple of extra things here just in terms of, uh, I call it a 24-hour folder. You can call it whatever you want. Um, I just, it's, you know, just a folder that doesn't get everything else put in it. It's not for homework. It's not for, um, you know, um, the, well, it could be for homework, I guess, if, if somebody needs to turn it in or make sure that you take that homework sheet home, complete it and bring it back. But whatever's in that folder needs to be addressed in 24 hours. So that um, helps to expedite communication between teacher and parent, but also making sure that um, things that need to be signed by parent get brought back to school and or homework um, gets turned in. Next. So I know that ran a little bit long for you guys and hope we have, I don't know, we'll turn it over to Wendy and see what, what's next. Thanks, Jan and Brandon. This is excellent. Um, if you are willing to stay on, Jan and Brandon, we have some great questions in the panel here. And if um, the attendees would like to stay on for a little bit, um, Jan and Brandon will answer some questions. You are welcome to type any other questions in the panel. Do you have about 15 minutes, Jan and Brandon, to stay on for questions? Okay, then we'll go over 15 minutes. And um, usually what we do, if there are questions that go unanswered, we will send them to Jan and Brandon at the end of the session. And when we respond to you in an email, uh, all attendees will receive an email. Answers to the questions um, will be on those as well. Um, before we go to our questions, because some people will need to jump off, I just want you to know, like Jan said, I put uh, links to some of the fabulous resources that Jan and Brandon mentioned in the chat. Um, also, I put um, where and how you can get support at the Tourette Association, um, more support by reaching out to support at Tourette.org. I put our phone number in there. Uh, Brandon mentioned the find a provider link. I let you know how you can get to that. And last, we are funded by the CDC. Um, in order to receive our funding, we need feedback on our wonderful presentations that we do for you. If you could use the link there when the presentation is over or as we're answering questions to fill out the survey, it would be much appreciated. So on that note, I'm going to start at the top here uh, with questions. Um, let's see. It looks like the first one would be, um, how do you help a child at the movies? I don't know if Jan or Brandon wants to take that a little bit. How would you help a child at the movies? Um, sure, I can I can start and then Jan, if you like to um, to add on. Uh, movies are tough <laughs> because you know you certainly want to ignore them, but it's one of those situations where a lot of other people could be affected. Um, so uh, certainly ignore the best that you can. And if there are noises that are loud, um, it can be helpful to teach a child just how to uh, breathe through their nose and uh, just to maintain uh, a nice cadence of breathing while they're watching, if at the movies, if they're able and willing and desire to participate. Um, but if they don't, Really ignoring is the best policy and uh, finding seats that are, you know, maybe as far away from the crowd as possible is um, is probably the best that, that you can do. But Jan, I'd love to hear any suggestions that you might have. Yeah, I think you hit it. Um, and then also the only other thing that I would suggest is um, using whatever techniques they might have to help calm um, and or minimize their um, tics prior to actually going into the movies. So using them in preparation, um, there's gonna be excitement, especially if it's a movie they've really been wanting to see. Um, they're meeting friends at the movie. So having them use those strategies, um, and a lot of times it's breathing, um, before they ever walk into this, um, to the movie theater um, is a great way to just sort of, if you think about it, just like priming the brain ready to um, 
a tick if possible um, or for as long as possible. Um, and then, you know, uh, giving the child permission to, to take leave if they need to, to get up, maybe stand in the back of the theater or, you know, walk out for just a few minutes and then come back in. Sometimes eating helps. Um, so having snacks. Um, other times ticks are worse with eating. So depending on your child, um, either have them eat before the movie starts if their ticks actually get worse with eating um, or if eating and drinking helps, then have them actually snacking during the movie. Great, thank you, Jan and Brandon. Um, the next question is, apart from CBIT, is there any other type of therapy that would work better with children with Tourette, especially neurodivergent? Do you wanna start on this one, Jan? Yeah, I can. So, you know, CBIT is the gold standard now for treatment of ticks. Um, it is highly effective, um, you know, conservatively, it helps 50% of kids uh, with uh, tick disorders to be able to learn to manage their ticks. And when we, we talk about manage, we're not talking about necessarily extinguishing ticks, although that does sometimes happen um, where the ticks go away. Um, but we're, we're teaching them how to manage. So they're, we're teaching them how to look at environments and make those environmental uh, modifications for themselves. What are things that are going to trigger my ticks? What are, you know, when I, this weekend we're doing something so, so fun and I know that I'm probably gonna have tick bouts. So how can I prepare myself ahead of time for that? Um, that other than that, um, we do certainly have those kids that do really well with having um, a lot of physical exercise. Um, and then also practicing mindfulness has been um, something that a lot of kids have said is very helpful to them. I think whatever your child will, you know, sort of commit to and get engaged with, that's probably the magic. Um, and if they feel like it helps them to be able to manage their tick, um, you as a parent notice um, some reduction in ticks, not necessarily the tick is gone, but that it's maybe less interruptive or that the tick bout seem further apart, then I would say, you know, applaud that and, and have them continue it. Great, did you wanna add anything, Brandon? I don't really have anything to add, no, that was, um, that was all wonderful. Um, I guess the only thing I would just reinforce is that if there are other, um, uh, Again, if there's other conditions that are increasing stress, addressing those other conditions through whatever the recommended um, type of therapy, um, you know, be it uh, DBT, uh, so learning coping skills um, and distress tolerance skills, or CBT, learning how to um, kind of chase down uh, thought patterns that are causing more stress, you know, anything like that can help improve ticks as well. Great, thank you. And the next question is, my son tends to tick loudly and intentionally in my seven month old daughter's face and scares her. How are we supposed to ignore this and not send him out of the room? Yes, uh, another tough one. Getting clarity um, so so the, this is certainly one of those behaviors that, that I understand why you don't want to ignore it, and I wouldn't recommend ignoring it. Um, first place I think I would start is maybe get some support on figuring out whether this behavior is a tick or not. Um, you know, if it's a tick, um, yeah, I think that's probably where I would start. Um, I, I don't know what uh, what kind of support you have at the moment, whether you've worked with a therapist, um, you know, whether your primary care provider's on board um, and understands ticks well, but if it's not a tick, certainly um, uh, sending your child from the room, I think is appropriate um, and setting some clear boundaries. Um, but, if it's a tick, uh, gosh, hmm. I think getting into the details on, you know, how might you just prevent it from happening? 
um, is probably a good place to explore, but you'd really have to kind of get into the details of when it's happening, um, how it's happening, are there certain environments it's more likely in. Um, those functional interventions can really uh, can really help, but really tracking when this is most likely to happen and then figuring out what types of separation or what types of strategies could prevent it from happening is probably your best bet. So is it happening in certain locations of the house at certain times of day? Is it more likely to happen in the car? If you can look at those details and kind of dissect it from um, where it's most likely and when it's most likely to happen, you'll be more capable of, um, of implementing some strategies to kind of prevent it. Um, if it is a tick. That's, I think, that's what I could offer, Jan. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would offer anything different from that. I think um, you're exactly right. Um, determining first if it's a tick or if it's something else that's happening, trying to prevent it or even a divert um, it to something else. Maybe have your son work for a reward if he's, uh, if he's able to not do it to your, to your daughter. Um, you know, so getting, having some agreement on what else he could do um, to engage with your daughter and not that tick, if it's a tick, um, and then set up a reward system that if he's able to meet that and do the other thing that's more desirable, then he gets, you know, incentive, uh, an incentive reward for that. Great. Great answers. Um, this question is kind of similar. And so I thought about skipping over it, but I think it's important um, because I think it has another layer to it. How to manage ticking siblings when they seem to feed off each other in a small space. Sometimes it's like the ticks target the siblings. Yeah, I can start with that one. Um, this is actually something that happens a great deal. Um, I think having those things um, not separate, but have sort of, even if it's in the same location, um, both of them kind of um, have some distance from each other, what they um, have on board to manage their ticks, and then come back again for a board game, um, or they wanna watch a TV show together, then ahead of that occurrence, um, then have them target their own ticks by using whatever strategies they have to minimize um, or just manage those ticks and then come together for watching of the show or playing of the board game. But during those particular activities, just ignore the ticks. I mean, if they tick and they tick off of, you know, they're actually, um, you know, sort of echo ticking from each other, just forget it, you know, just let them enjoy the board game or let them enjoy the show together. Um, and But then when they're not engaged in that, um, that activity together, then have them working on their ticks separately. Um, but when more than one person is in a household that has ticks, there's going to be that, you know, phenomenon of uh, that echo phenomenon happening. Um, and unless it's in during a time when, you know, ticks really need to be um, super managed, then I, you know, probably you, there's not a lot that you're going to do to prevent it um, other than um, having each person be very cognizant during that um, either before time or after time of, of managing their own ticks. Brandon? Yeah, I'd agree. Even, um, even some education for your kids that ticks are suggestible, kind of like yawns. Um, if we see somebody else yawn, it can cause us to and kind of suggest a yawn um, for ourselves and ticks are the same way. For those of us with tick disorders, seeing somebody else do a similar movement can cause us to feel that urge to do it ourselves. And just providing a little bit of education to your kids that that is the case, it might help them a little bit, just understanding that if they're, they may notice when they're feeding off of that. But again, it's not really a big deal unless it's really bothering them. So you might just let them tick away um, and then maybe they understand that it's happening and they can kind of uh, uh, adjust their environment. They'll learn how to adjust their environments if they want to. Um, but again, it should be at their discretion. Great. Thank you so much, Jen and Brandon. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is and the webinar here, since it's almost 8.15, um, your answers to the questions were so thorough. And hopefully for those who could have stayed on, 
you know, it provided some, some additional great information. The rest of the questions I will send out to Jan and Brandon. Um, we'll divide and conquer. There are such great questions. I hope that you found the webinar informative. Um, please do take a minute to fill out the survey in the chat and um, take a look at the resources there. I'd like to thank um, Jan and Brandon for this amazing um, webinar and this great information. I hope it helps everybody at what is a start, whether you started school or you will be starting school, um, start to this school year and know that you can always reach out to us at the Tourette Association, uh, support at Tourette.org. I put our number in the chat there. Please reach out anytime for anything. Thank you so much for attending and we'll be in touch with all of you, I'm sure at some point. Thank you, Jan and Brandon.